Good morning and welcome to the Hawaii State Senate Committee on Commerce and Consumer Protection. This is our Friday, April 5th, 2024 uh, agenda in conference room 229 at the Hawaii State Capitol to hear uh, governor's nominations to various boards and commissions. Uh, this meeting is being streamed live on YouTube in the unlikely event that we have to abruptly end this hearing due to technical difficulties, the committee will reconvene to discuss any outstanding business on Thursday, April 11th at 9.30 a.m. in this room 229. And a public notice will be posted on the legislature's website. For testifiers participating remotely, uh, we have a two-minute testimony limit. We have received and reviewed all of your written testimony. If you're online, your audio will be muted and video disabled until shortly before it is your turn to testify. Uh, as is our customary practice, we respectfully request that you summarize or clarify your written testimony uh, instead of reading it verbatim, especially if you're online, because we can tell when you're reading from a screen. Uh, your two minutes are your own. You can feel free to use them as you wish, but we have already read your written testimony. And with that, uh, what I would like to do, and we've notified the nominee, you know, without objection members, I would like to move GM 705 to the end of the agenda, and we will take up the, the remainder of the nominees, move them out, and then clear the space for uh, Mr. Yost and his um, nomination. So first up, we will take on uh, Governor's Message 706, James Tam for consideration and confirmation to the Board of Electricians and Plumbers for a term to expire June 30, 2028. Uh, DCCA Director Nadine Ando in support. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, member of the committee. Nadine Ando here on behalf of the DCCA and the Board of Electricians. Thank you very much. Uh, we also have Al Itamoto from the Electrical Contractors Association of Hawaiian Sport. These are written. Uh, we have written testimony from the Hawaii Electricians Market Enhancement Program, Ryan Takahashi in support. Uh, IBW Local 1186, Damian Kim in support. IBW Local 1260, Kika Bukowski in support. And late testimony from the Plumbers and Fitters, Local 675, Matthew Brady in support. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to testify? Good morning. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, Committee Members. Kika Bukowski on behalf of IBW Local 1260. We did submit testimony in support of Mr. Tam, and uh, we, we, uh, we stand on our testimony in support, but just wanted to add a few comments. Um, as you know, this, this session uh, ha, you know, has brought on some, some issues um, involving uh, the electrical industry and uh, all the different sectors involved. And we just want to make note uh, that, that although we, we are completely confident in Mr. Tam, I've known Mr. Tam for a number of years, as long as I've been involved in the construction trades industry, and we feel that his uh, legal experience is, is exemplary and we look forward to working with him. Um, but we did want to just comment that these you know, his appointment is one of three public appointments to a seven member board uh, with, you know, and, and we would like to think that the public members uh, are, our intent is to look out for the public's interest. Um, you know, there are numerous or several different sectors within the electrical industry of which there is no uh, representation on the EL, ELP, uh, ENP board currently. And a lot of the decisions um, that are made at the EMP board have impacts beyond their authority and their jurisdiction uh, to other sectors of the electrical industry that impact the work that we do and the members that we serve. And so we hope that uh, we look forward to working with him, but just want to make note that we, we hope that in the forward, uh, in the future, we could have a more diverse uh, representation from all sectors of the electrical industry uh, as the decisions they make can have uh, major impacts on these other areas that again like I said sit outside of the purview and authority of this particular board 
but are impacted by the decisions that they make. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to testify? Okay, would the nominee like to speak? Uh, my name is Jim Tan. Good morning. Good morning, So, uh, uh, you know, for the nominees, the, don't worry about the clock. <laughs> I, I don't have a long yeah. <laughs> essay to read to you or, or say to you. I just say that um, I'm happy to say I'm a recovering attorney. I'm not doing that anymore. Okay, so um, at White No Star, offense taken. <laughs> at White Star, I'm, um, I'm, I'm more working with financing Hawaii projects now uh, for Hawaii developers. And um, we, we hope we can do more financing, especially in the affordable housing area. And it's much more, uh, it's a much more fulfilling uh, mission than what I was doing earlier in my life. So uh, I'm willing to serve if it's my fate to do so. And I have, uh, I think, the skills to independently evaluate and vote in the public interest on any matters that come before this board. That's all. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, members, any questions for Mr. Tam? OK, seeing none, uh, thank you again. We'll move on to the next uh, nominee, Governor's Message 707, Janet Permiano, for consideration and confirmation to the Board of Professional Engineers, Architects, Surveyors, and Landscape Architects for a term to expire June 30, 2027. Uh, the one and only testifier is Sheena, Sheena Choi from the Board, of, uh, from the board in support. Thank you for standing on your testimony and support. Uh, that's all the testimony we've received. Is there anyone else who would like to comment on this nomination? Okay, would the nominee like to speak? Good morning. Thank you, Honorable Chair and um, Vice Chair and, uh, and member of the board um, of the committee, excuse me. I'm bringing this forward because I'm a little nervous. I haven't done this for years, but I've, um, I um, am seeking a second um, term uh, for the Isla board. And um, it's, it's a wonderful, I'm, as a public member, and it's a wonderful experience. Um, growing up as a youngster in Kahu many years ago, many, many years ago, uh, <laughs> um, I've been in the construction business. My father has been in the construction business. So we've, we've dealt with uh, and worked with engineers and uh, architects and landscape surveyors. And um, it, it was, um, and engineers, and I have family members that are also in the engineer um, uh, engineers um, in my family. Um, I've always put the public first and protection of the public first. Um, growing up in Kahalu'u again, uh, I was a JPO. And so that's when I first um, recognized the importance of protecting the public. And uh, um, I've graduated from the University of Hawaii um, dental hygiene program. I have my master's in public health. And uh, so um, worked many years with the Head Start and with uh, Kokoa Kalei Valley and uh, have been also in the clinical setting. So my, one of my strength, it strengths is being a dental hygienist and being uh, 12 years of experience of being on a board for a dentistry. And uh, I'm currently um, on the board of directors for a national test, testing agency and examination developer and that's uh, CDCA, Reb, and CEDA. And so I am one of the two uh, dental hygienists that, and w one of the two that has, um, has ever been representing Hawaii, the state of Hawaii, um, ever in uh, dental hygiene on that board. So um, I've learned a lot through um, being on this board, and um, I appreciate all the different um, aspects of this board and I would like to continue one more 
uh, term, which is my maximum, uh, to serve um, with the Eastleigh Board again. So, um, I, I, is there anything else you want to ask me? This is my security thing, so. <laughs> you did great. Thank you very much for <laughs> coming up and testifying and yeah. <laughs> uh, and uh, stepping forward to serve again. Members, are there any yeah, questions? Question. Senator Richards. Yeah, thank you. Um, and you did well, so don't worry about that one. Um, I had to go back and look when I was reading through, I was seeing dental hygienists, and then I was looking at the architects and surveyors. and I was going, now wait a second, do I have the right information together? Uh, and so I was curious, how are you going to tie this together? And you did. Serving nationally on the boards, that bringing that institutional type of thinking is very, very helpful. And also, it's outside the industry, so it brings a different perspective. And for me, that's really important when we're looking at it. I also saw that you're part of RICO, and um, I serve in a capacity in that as well. It brings a different perspective, so I appreciate that. I'll be supporting you, but you did well. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> I was a little concerned about. No, no, you did good. <laughs> like I said, when I was reading, I was concerned. I said, "Is my paperwork screwed up?" So, anyway, all good. So, thank you, Chair. Any other questions? Okay, I have a question. Okay, yes. That um, I've asked another nominee to this board. Yes. So I think that nominee would think it unfair if I did not ask it of another sitting member, which is for your response and feeling about a, an article that was published in Civil Beat in September about a licensed architect who was convicted uh, of a felony for bribery that subsequently left, um, uh, that subsequently led to other convictions in the city and county of Honolulu's planning department. And the article primarily spoke about how that individual is still licensed and before Sheena gets up, I want to acknowledge that Rico, Rico has responsibility for the investigation and has not completed it. <coughs> However, this person appears to still be licensed. And as of the writing, which was several months ago, uh, was st still maintained active permits. And so going forward, because it's going, that situation will be resolved when it gets resolved, and then a decision will conceivably, after the resolution of the investigation, will, will come before your board. And so without speaking to that specific individual and your action that, that might be taken in relation to that, can you just help us understand your feeling about that situation and your role and perhaps duty on the board to account for you know, the, the perception that this has created around your body. Yes. Um, personally, I was very appalled by that because um, that situation, because it was, um, I, I um, am truly ashamed that this <coughs> happened and that um, I always believe in the truth and being honorable and I'm doing the right thing. And um, so as a board member, um, and current chair. I don't know how I got a pub, uh, become chair of this board, mm -hmm. but I'm a public member, and um, and it truly is a an opportunity for me. Um, that our our protocol is to submit to Rico, and Rico will go through this case, and we are we haven't heard anything from Rico yet. So when we hear something from Rico, we're going to address it, and. Um, yeah, I'm not. I'm not happy with that situation. Um, do you think that there uh, is potentially more that could be done by your board or by the DCCA or by the legislature if you were to make a recommendation mm -hmm. to um, account for what's happened then? provide some assurance to the public that we're taking reasonable steps to make sure it doesn't happen again? Yes, we do have, um, we do have the protocol uh, as a board to go through RICO first. 
And so that's what we're waiting for. So if you can hurry them up, that would be wonderful. <laughs> so that we can address it at our next meeting. So noted. <laughs> so, um, so that's what we're waiting for. And, and once we get that word from Kimiko, we're, we're going to address it. OK. Yeah. Thank you. Members, any other questions? OK, thank you very much for coming up and taking questions on top of talking. <laughs> we'll move on to the next right. uh, Thank GM. You so Thank, you. Thank you. Uh, Governor's message 708, Nicholas Ching, for consideration and confirmation to the Motor Vehicle Industry Licensing Board for a term to expire June 30, 2028. Uh, first up in support, DCCA Director Ando. Thank you very much. We also have written testimony in support from Stephen Chow. Is there anyone else who would like to testify? Okay, seeing none, Mr. Ching, good morning. Hi, good morning. Uh, if you'd like to make a statement to the committee, I, I'd like to disclose that I know the nominee and uh, <laughs> looks quite dapper this morning. Thank you for stepping forward. Oh, thank you. Uh, if you'd like to address the committee, please uh, feel free. I don't have much uh, to say other than, you know, my I've been an attorney in uh, private practice here in Hawaii since 2012. Uh, I guess as far as board experience, I've been the president of my condo association uh, since 2015, and it's a nine member board. And, and so I do have some experience uh, being on a board and dealing with those matters. Um, other than that, I just want to thank those who have supported my nomination to the board as a public member. And I look forward to serving and giving back to the community if I should be confirmed. Thank you very much. Members, any questions? Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Ching, for making yourself available and stepping forward to serve. We'll move to the next. Thank you. Uh, member on our agenda, Governor's Message 709, Edward Chu Jr. to the Board of Private Detectives and Guards for a term to expire June 30, 2028. Uh, for the Board of Private Guards and Detectives, Rhonda Roldan in support. Thank you very much. Uh, that's the only testifier we have. Is there anyone else who would like to testify? Okay, do we have the nominee? Do we have the nominee online? Not present on Zoom, Chair. Okay, uh, not necessary. We have, met, uh, we have um, interviewed the nominee uh, prior to the hearing. Members, any questions for the board? Okay, we'll move on. Governor's message 631, Destiny Irvine Halama, for consideration and confirmation to the Motor Vehicle Repair Industry Board for a term to expire June 30, 2028. Uh, Director Ando, DCCA, in support. Yes, uh, party chair, vice chair, member of the committee. We stand on our written testimony in support of the motion to expire June 30, 2028. Thank you for standing on your testimony in support. Is there anyone else who would like to testify? Okay, do we have the nominee? Not present on Zoom, Chair. Okay, thank you. Uh, members, unless there are questions for the DCCA, we'll move on to GM 737, Miles Kamimura, for consideration and confirmation to the Board of Electricians and Plumbers for a term to expire June 30, 2028. Uh, Director Ando in support. Um, good morning again. Um, we stand on our testimony Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have IBW Local 1260, Mr. Bukowski. We stand on our testimony in support. Thank you for standing on your testimony. Brian Lee in support. And late testimony from the Plumbers and Fitters Local 675, Matthew Brady in support. And IBW Local uh, 1186, Damien Kim in support. Is there anyone else who would like to testify? Okay, do we have the nominee? 
not present on Zoom. Thank Karen. you. Okay, we'll move on to the next nominee. Governor's message 739, Danny Takanishi, for consideration and confirmation to the Hawaii Medical Board for a term to expire June 30, 2027. Uh, Hawaii Medical Board, Randy Ho in support. Chair, Vice Chair, Committee Member, my name is Randy Ho, an Executive Officer for the Hawaii Medical Board. Uh, the Board supports the reappointment of uh, Dr. Danny Takanishi to the Board as a licensed Honolulu County Member. Uh, Dr. Takanishi is a board certified physician with over 30 years of experience in the medical field. He holds a bachelor's degree in physical therapy from the University of Hawaii Medical Association, and Elizabeth Ignacio in support. Uh, we have uh, Mar Maria Chun in support. <coughs> Lee Buen Consejo Lam, uh, Dean Lee Buen Consejo Lam in support, and late testimony from Gary Belcher of the Hawaii Medical Board and JC McIlanick of the Queens Health System. Is there anyone else who would like to testify? Okay. Um, Mr. Takanishi, good morning. Uh, good morning. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're fine. Please go ahead. <laughs> so, aloha, Chair. Uh, Keoho Kaloli and Vice Chair Fukunaga, other members of the committee. First of all, thank you very much for this opportunity to provide some testimony. And I'm not going to reiterate what's already in my materials. I just wanted to make a few points. You know, one is I was born and raised in Hawaii, uh, in the Mukali area specifically, proud graduate of the public school system. I uh, went to the University of Hawaii as both an undergraduate and for my medical education and had some of my training in Hawaii and also um, in the continental United States. So Hawaii is someplace that's very near and dear to me. A lot of what I've done for uh, pretty much my entire professional life is to really um, help to uh, serve the public, I guess, if you will. Uh, at least for me, one of the most rewarding things that, that I do. And so being on the medical board for a second term will allow me to do it in a way that I think is important. But the second point that I wanted to make is, you know, having been a first liner, um, you know, doing surgical ICU and having to take care of uh, uh, patients who had COVID uh, from 2020 and uh, in a time where, uh, you know, we were short on staff, but we made it through because we knew we had to and we knew that was the thing that uh, we, we just didn't think twice about it. But what it really raised, I think, to the consciousness of everyone was the importance of having an adequate and a healthy workforce. So I think what happened is with your help and other members uh, of the uh, state legislature, last year, Hawaii became the 38th state uh, to join the Interstate Medical Licensure Compact, which is a step in the right direction. Uh, for preparedness, uh, should something ever happen uh, to that degree. The second thing is uh, Representative uh, Martin had called me in January uh, about a prior bill that uh, I guess had not made its way through and it was looking at how to uh, better incorporate individuals who have medical degrees but had not completed postgraduate training. So. That brings the second point that while the board has to work within a very narrow scope under statutes, there are things that the board can do to work collaboratively with others such as yourselves and, uh, and the hospitals, the medical associations, you know, and other stakeholders, the public to find ways that we can do this. That's very responsible. So that brings up the second point that there are things that are very important that I would hope to be able to potentially shepherd with my colleagues on the board. Again, honoring our statutes and working within our statutes because that is our uh, that is our construct and our context. But um, I, I just wanted to say that uh, I, I seek a second term uh, for all the reasons noted, and uh, and I hope that um, you will give me that opportunity. And my final closing uh, point is that I apologize, I would have been there in person, but I'm actually in Washington DC for a one day meeting because there's this national advisory commission that was formed to look at just what uh, Representative Martin had asked me about uh, at a na national level. And I was fortunate enough to be tapped into that, to find ways that through a number of 
large national medical education and advocacy organizations, such as the American Medical Association and the ACGME, that we can work to create a white paper, so to speak, mm -hmm. so that medical boards can use that as a template mm -hmm. to go forward in a very balanced and responsible manner to make sure mm -hmm. that at all costs, public safety is always protected. And so with that, I'll stop and um, I'm, I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Takanishi. Members, any questions? Okay. Uh, no need to apologize for your absence. I do appreciate you making yourself available on online. Uh, and thank you again for stepping forward to serve. So uh, if there are no other questions, we'll take a brief recess. Okay, reconvening this 9.30 a.m. agenda to hear Governor's Message 740, uh, Mr. Robert Gregg, for consideration and co confirmation to the Elevator Mechanics Licensing Board for a term to expire June 30, 2027. Uh, first up in support, uh, Elevator Mechanics Licensing Board. James, Hello, good morning. Hello, Chair and members of the committee. James Kizuski here, um, Executive Officer of the Elevator Mechanics Licensing Board here in support of Chair Greg's reappointment. So thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Skizuski. And we also have written support from Mark Yamane of the International Union of Elevator Construction Constructors Local 126. Is there anyone else who would like to testify? Okay, seeing none, Mr. Greg. Good morning. Yes. Good morning. Sorry, I would have been there, but uh, I'm, I'm stuck at work. Uh, so I couldn't make it out there. Uh, again, that's totally fine on this committee. Would you like to make a statement to the committee? Uh, yeah, um, you know, I, I'm just uh, seeking re-election for a second term. Uh, I've been on the board for the past uh, four years, I believe. And I've, I've enjoyed the time there. Um, you know, I've uh, worked real close with uh, with James and uh, the rest of the board members to make sure that uh, we get our, our guys licensed, uh, our apprentices registered. And, uh, uh, yeah, I just want to continue doing that and uh, make sure that uh, our conveyances are worked on by uh, licensed elevator guys. Okay. Thank you very much. Members, any questions? Okay. Seeing none, thank you again for stepping forward to serve and making yourself available for the hearing. We'll move on right. to the next nominee, Governor's Message 741, Sherry Tokumaru, for consideration to the Board of Pharmacy for a term to expire June 30, 2028. Uh, first up in support, James Kazuski, Board of Pharmacy. Good morning. Hello, Chair. Thank you for your time, James here. Uh, standing on our written testimony in support of the reappointment for uh, Sherry Tokumaru. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next, we have Ray Matsumoto for the University of Hawaii in support. We have uh, Ronald Taniguchi in support, Jared Prudencio in support, Nicole Young in support, and Alana Isobe in support. Is there anyone else who would like to testify? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to the next nominee, Governor's Message 742. Wayne Deluz for consideration to the Motor Vehicle Industry Licensing Board for a term to expire June 30, 2028. Uh, first up, we have Hector West for the Motor Vehicle Industry Licensing Board. Hello, Chair and members of the board. My name is Hector West, uh, Executive Officer for the Motor Vehicle Industry Licensing Board. And the board stands on this uh, testimony in support. Thank you. Thank you for standing on your testimony in support. Uh, Robert Gardner for Bank of Hawaii in support. And late testimony from the Hawaii Automobile Dealers Association in support. John Uekawa in support and Melissa Pavlosek in support. Is there anyone else who would like to testify? Okay, Mr. Deleuze, good morning. 
Morning, Chair, the rest of the committee. Um, I would love to have been there, but uh, this is Mary Monarch Wheat on the Big Island, and uh, we don't have enough jets. <laughs> so, but, uh, but it's going well. Um, we always know when the Mary Monarch is coming because we get a lot of rain. So Hilo blesses everybody. But thank you um, for the opportunity to give testimony today. Um, I've been I was born and raised in Hawaii, five generations of uh, Portuguese. Um, I'm a second generation new car franchise dealer. Um, the um, my my focus in serving on the motor vehicle board is to uh, achieve uh, uh, improved protection for consumers, as I've done in the past, as well as um, ensuring that the auto dealers are in compliance of uh, the ever changing laws that govern us. Uh, I have a lot of experience working with the. Chapter 437 that, excuse me, that governs uh, auto dealers and uh, would uh, appreciate the opportunity to serve on the board. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much for making yourself available and for stepping forward to serve. Members, any questions? Okay, uh, thank you again. We'll move to the next nominee, Governor's Message 743, Kenneth Obanski for consideration to the Motor Vehicle Industry Licensing Board for a term to expire. June 30, 2028. Uh, first up, we have Nidin Ando, DCCA, in support. Good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, Member of the Committee on Capital DCCA. We stand on our written testimony in support of this nomination. Thank you for standing on your testimony. And from uh, the Office of the Mayor, I'm not sure which one, Robert Command, submitting testimony in support. Is there anyone else who would like to testify? Okay, I'm told the nominee is not uh, available. Any questions for the DCCA? Okay, then we'll move on to the next nominee, Governor's Message 744, Carlton Williams, to the Motor Vehicle Industry Licensing Board for a term to expire June 30, 2028. Uh, Director Ando, DCCA, in support. Thank you very much for standing on your testimony. Kathy Castillo in support. Wendell Lee in support. Is there anyone else who would like to testify? Okay, Mr. Williams, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> um, my name is Carlton Williams and I am honored to be considered for this position. Uh, I believe I understand the purpose and the process very well, having done two terms on the Board of Public Accountancy until a few years ago, uh, and also having worked with automobile dealerships throughout my career, both in Honolulu and Hilo since the early 1980s. So I, I have a good understanding of what the profession is and uh, the dealers, automobile dealers I know are very concerned as with other professions about maintaining the integrity. So they're concerned to about the public interest as are others. So thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much, members. Any questions? Okay, thank you for thank joining you. us today and for stepping forward to serve. Uh, next, we will move to Governor's Message 745. Sherry Mizumoto for consideration to the Board of Acupuncture, term to expire June 30, 2028. Uh, one testifier in support, Director Ando, DCCA. Thank you for standing on your testimony. And uh, next we have the nominee. Good morning. Good Ms. morning. Ms. Aloha, everyone. And thank you today for considering me for the occupancy. Okay. Good this would be my first time. <laughs> Um, although, hi now, by the way, and notably right now, I am on a couple of rotary boards. I've been a Rotarian for many years. And just being out here right now and serving our community like we have been as Rotarians since this wildfire has just given me more passion to help the people of Hawaii, especially on safety and health, with moving acupuncture forward. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. uh, members, any questions? Okay, thank you again for uh, making yourself available this morning and for Absolutely. stepping forward to Thank serve. Uh, 
Okay, so uh, on the nominees that we've just heard, uh, I would like to note that we have uh, interviewed each of these individuals, even the ones that were unable to make it, uh, make themselves available for the hearing today, and I'm prepared to make a recommendation. Members, are there any issues with that? Okay, so without objection, I would like to recommend that we advise and consent to each of the following nominees that we've just heard uh, in one motion. Those are James Tam, GM706, Janet Permiano, GM707, Nicholas Ching, GM708, Edward Chu Jr., GM709, Destiny Irvine Halama, GM631, Miles Kamimura, GM737, uh, Danny Takanishi, GM739, Robert Gregg, GM740, Sherry Tokumaru, GM741, Wayne Deluz, GM742, Kenneth Obensky, GM743, Carlton Williams, GM744, and Sherry Mizumoto, GM745. Any questions or concerns? No. Seeing none, uh, Vice Chair for the vote uh, to advise and consent, Chair votes aye. Thank you. Vice Chair also votes aye. Senator McKelvey? Yes, sir. Senator Richards? Aye. Senator Awa is excused. Your recommendation is adopted. Uh, thank you very much. Congratulations to all the nominees. We'll take a brief recess. Okay, reconvening this Friday, April 5th, 2024, 9.30 a.m. agenda to take up uh, our last nominee on this agenda, who was actually our first, Governor's Message 705, Colin Yost, for consideration and reconfirmation to the Public Utilities Commission for a term to expire June 30, 2028. Uh, first testifier we have uh, in support, Hawaii State Energy Office. Good morning. Thank you, Mr. Glick, for standing on your testimony in support. Uh, next, we have Nadine Ando, Director of the DCCA, in support. Thank you very much. Uh, Kiko Bukowski, IBW 11, uh, 1260, excuse me, in support. <laughs> Uh, Chair, Vice Chair, Committee Members, uh, Kiko Bukowski, IBW 1260, uh, in strong support of uh, the nominee. And I, I just, I know you, you know, it would be better to, for me to stand on our testimony, but I just wanted to say real briefly that, um, you know, um, the, the union has been very uh, appreciative of, of Mr. Yost the last year. Um, he's been very helpful and responsive. When we've uh, we've been trying to become more uh, involved in the PUC process to better understand it and to uh, and to try to um, bring uh, bring a voice of labor to the table because the decisions they make impact our members and um, we just appreciate what the PUC has been doing and appreciate uh, working with uh, Mr. Yost for the last year and uh, strongly support his reappointment. Thank you, Sandy Wong in support. Not present on Zoom, Chair. Thank you. Leo Asuncion in support. Thank you very much for standing on your testimony. We also have written testimony, and feel free to come up if you desire, from uh, the following individuals. In total, we had 35 pieces of testimony submitted, all of them in support. Uh, Gwen Yamamoto Lau of the Hawaii Green Infrastructure Authority. Uh, Ernie Lau of the Board of Water Supply, Jody Robinson, Blue Planet Foundation, Micah Munikata, Ulupono Initiative, Ella Aki of Solark, Paul Oram of Photon Works Engineering, 
we have a Mr. Kuramoto of Solar Help Hawaii, Rachel Asu, Malama Solar, Noelani Derrickson, Tesla, Sandra Larson, AES Hawaii, Caroline Carl, Hawaii Energy, uh, Matthew White, Kristen Izumi Nital, Mark Anderson, Dolan Eversol, Malia Eversol, Patricia Van Curren, Jason Suapaya, Virginia Tincher, Jaco Van Delden, Naomi Kuai, Kiala Peters, Scott Sato, Jeremy Roberts, Royce Gaggs, Carl Friedman, and late testimonies submitted again, all in support from Rocky Mould of the Hawaii Solar Energy Association. Neil Martin of Elko Inc., Hale Takazawa, and Stephen Reijma of Sunrun. Is there anyone else who would like to testify? Okay, seeing none, uh, Mr. Yost. Good morning. Good morning and aloha, Chair, uh, Vice Chair Fukunaga, members of the committee. Aloha. I'm Colin Yost. I'm a commissioner on the PUC, and it's been my honor to serve the state of Hawaii for the last 17 months. Uh, it's been memorable and challenging experience, but I've, uh, yeah, I've enjoyed it uh, and really appreciated my colleagues and the other commissioners. Um, so I'm here before you obviously requesting a full term of six years and um, I'm committed to continuing to do my best to ensure that the PUC is an effective regulator, that we are independent, uh, that we are objective, uh, and that we um, you know, do our best to ensure the safety and the reliability and the resiliency and the affordability of the, the services that are provided by our public utilities, uh, which are all necessities and are very important to the people of Hawaii. So thank you very much for your consideration. Thank you. Members, questions? Somebody got to go first. Let me, okay, Vice Chair. <laughs> You know, the last time uh, you appeared before us, you spoke about some of the work that the PUC has been doing on the um, uh, wildfire investigations. And you talked about how, uh, you know, you took many of the concerns to heart and were planning to uh, follow up with your colleagues. And so today we really want to see um, if you have anything to report back to us since that time. Uh, well, just yesterday afternoon, we were engaged in a whiteboard session to discuss next steps. Um, and we, we did take the recommendations of the Senate to heart. We agreed with the intent of all the resolutions that are in uh, SCR 182, SR 156, I believe. So um, we, we are moving forward to figure out other actions to take. Um, we are awaiting you know, the results of the Attorney General's report, the Maui Fire ATF report, um, and also some of the conclusions of our own staff relating to the investigation that we've been carrying on specifically about the uh, operation and the utility infrastructure in Lahaina uh, that the utility has conceded ignited a fire in the morning of August 8th. So uh, we are, are waiting for more specific kind of conclusions and recommendations to us from our staff on those questions. But we've also been paying attention to other testimony that's been received even just recently uh, before the Senate, uh, actually before the House most recently in the Finance Committee, um, paying attention to information that is becoming more public and more specific about potential causes, potential issues that may uh, need to be addressed with our infrastructure. And we, we are we're paying attention to all of that and seeking to follow up and, and learn uh, the truth and figure out the right answer of what to do next. OK, well, I'm happy to um, <laughs> encourage other members to follow up. I, I do note that um, you know, in some of the um, previous testimony on those resolutions, the PUC was characterized as more of a reactive body rather than a really um, proactive body. And the times that we are in seem to really call for a much more proactive role. So, um, you know, hopefully as we move forward in the next two weeks, there will be opportunities to see a broader, uh, up, I guess, authority being exercised by the PUC. And we hope that we will see some um, exciting uh, new solutions. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair. And we hear you loud and clear. Members, questions? Yeah. Senator Richards. Senator Richards. Yeah. yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, 
interesting time. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that you've embraced what we were talking about through the resolutions uh, on point. Uh, following up with Senator Fukunaga's statement about proactive, not reactive. And I think we, my expectation, I think our, we as senators, our expectation is PUC takes a very firm role in getting this to be resolved, not just letting it sit. And so I would strongly encourage to keep pushing forth aggressively to get this thing attended to because letting it sit is not what we're expecting. We're expecting good response. And so um, you know, an interesting time that you signed up for and you're going through right now. Um, you have a lot of support coming forth, uh, but the intention is now this is when we really need to have some expectations met. So thanks for willing to continue. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Senator McKelvey. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you for being here uh, again. Um, you know, I just I wanted you to touch upon, you know, some of the things, you know, obviously we, part of the legislature's job is to look forward. Lahaina was a canary in the coal mine. And I saw it on display yesterday over at the convention center when they had the steam kids there, energy office, I don't know if they're in the room, was there with the display showing all the different overlays. And I called up a transmission overlay as well as a wildfire overlay. And you look at Maka Kilo and there could, that's an area over there that's potentially, but <clears throat> what is the PUC looking to do, whether you're commenting on some of the bills and initiatives or as a body to try to be more, to be proactive in so far as hardening of the infrastructure, trying to identify areas that are in jeopardy of vegetation, wind, wind map events. Can you tell us to the committee how you can help all communities move forward and so far as trying to achieve that goal. Yes, absolutely. I can point to two things which I think are some of the most important things we're doing. Uh, serving on the state wildfire mitigation um, working group with, uh, you know, it was commissioned by General Hara and a number of other state actors are on that board, are on that working group. Uh, it's looking at all the solutions. The utilities are in that conversation as well, are attending those meetings not just HECO, but also KIUC. And we are talking very concretely and specifically about the near-term improvements that need to be made. And, and some of them are already being made and are causing other issues as to reliability. Um, when you have uh, new fast trip settings uh, imposed on lines and new uh, blockers of the, the former reclose mechanisms that used to cause electricity to come back on automatically. There are now blockers in many lines which require that you have actual people go out and walk the line before they re-energize. Um, that's that's a, a sensible, uh, immediate precaution to take in a, a number of these very sensitive and vulnerable areas, but it's not a long-term solution. Everyone realizes we don't want to be shutting off the power you know, every couple weeks or every week uh, when you have the wind blow a little bit strong or a tree branch just, you know, bounce off a line but not break it. So a lot of very specific conversations about solutions and new technologies are, are happening there. Um, the other one is that we issued an order requiring all utilities, not just electric utilities, to issue natural hazard mitigation reports to the Public Utility Commission, which will be made public. Uh, dealing not just with wildfire, but also hurricane, tsunami, uh, all other natural disasters that we face here in Hawaii. And those reports will be coming in August. Uh, we will be looking at all of them. They'll be public, they'll be transparent. They should give all of us a, a pretty good idea of where all of our utilities are in their disaster mitigation planning. And hopefully we'll, we'll reveal vulnerabilities, weaknesses, things that we need to improve. And we expect a number of dockets, a number of other initiatives will come out of those reports as we review them. And as utilities, you know, recognize they have work to do uh, to make their infrastructure safer and more reliable. Just two questions, if I may. The other one is, it seems to me I'm kind of like, I'll just be blunt, like yelling at the wall. I've always been trying to advocate for undergrounding and not, I understand it can't be applied universally globally you know, for many reasons, cost me one of them. But surely in the example I just gave and what's happened, there might be areas where the Public Utilities Commission could identify segments, if you will. For, is there gonna be any action of the commission on this front with the utilities to look at this kind of, if nothing else, where you have high risk 
vulnerable areas for this kind of strategy? Absolutely. Yeah, that, that will definitely be a strategy going forward. And as you say, because of the water table uh, level in certain areas, it's not possible to do 100% undergrounding. It's also extremely expensive. But absolutely, I believe there are areas where undergrounding is going to be the right solution. And that is a subject matter in that state uh, wildfire uh, mitigation task force. It's, it's focused on that as well as a lot of other things. And there could be new technologies too that might be coming down the pike to create some kind of a hardening but yet not going completely underground. Yeah, I mean you've got uh, ins better insulation of lines themselves, right? That California is looking at this, right? Uh, PG&E proposed to the CPUC, the, the California Public Utilities Commission, to underground everything. Yeah. And that would be a massive yeah. expense uh, well <laughs> beyond the public budget. And the Public Utilities Commission there is looking at where, where can we find balance? Where can we find alternatives that in certain areas may be almost as effective as that? Um, another idea that's come up recently, and I, don't, I can't vouch for this, this method, but you could put lines on the ground in heavy concrete conduit. And it's just lying on top of the ground. The conduit would be strong enough that if a tree fell on it, it would break the conduit, but not the line. So, I mean, that, that's a, a new technique that's being thought about, and it might be appropriate in certain parts right, so of the I think life. it would work very well, because Blue Rock has been a challenge, have brought up geological challenges. You have a ravines and such where, but hopefully that'll be something the commission will use as an example that there could be a way to harden the infrastructure, but not have the hurdle. Uh, and just final question, Chair, your power generation has been a big issue. I hear from independent power producers, there's been no RFPs put out for power generation. How are we going to achieve this goal of renewable energy if there's no movement on generation or request for proposals on generation? Any thoughts you might have on that side of the coin? Yeah, we actually did. The, the utility, HECO did approve um, a number of bidders for RFP3 that just finished its cycle. And those haven't come before the commission yet, but all of those projects are actually public and online. Um, I mean, I noticed there was one concern uh, of the concerns mentioned in the whereas section of the resolution specifically to Maui, right? Wondering what's happening with projects that were canceled on Maui and delays and so forth. So the RFP3 for Maui, um, it contains 40 megawatts of firm biofuel uh, with a 2027 uh, energization uh, deadline. It also contained three solar plus battery storage projects, um, which add up in total to 80 megawatts of generation plus 240 hours of uh, megawatt hours of storage. And the utility is representing to us that that will actually be adequate to offset the other fossil fuel plants that are going to be retired sometime between 2028 and 2029. Right I mean, is that in the I mean, even if it wasn't retired, the, one of the, that brings up the issue of generation facilities in tsunami zone inundation. That's right. You're right. Um, and that that I think utility is taking that into account in its RFP process, the site siting of them. But yeah, the the Kahului and the Malaya are the ones that are, are now scheduled for retirement, right? Malaya is somewhere between 2027 and 2029 uh, because of unavailable equipment. They just can't, they can't keep fixing it. Um, and then you've got Kahalui that's getting shut down uh, because of air permit uh, issues from the Department of Health. Um, HECO has asked for an extension uh, into 2028, and thus far Department of Health has been granting those extensions. But we, we've got to line everything up, obviously, to yeah. make sure that when old things go away, we have something new to replace it. Uh, that's, that's kind of a big lesson of the whole AES coal plant situation, right? Is that we didn't have adequate generation resources and we had to scramble and, and backfill with uh, temporary programs. And that was a challenge. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. I appreciate the, the questions. Chair. Sure. Senator Richards. Yeah. That triggered a conversation, um, Big Island and our generation challenges. Uh, and I think you, you already touched on it, aging infrastructure and maintenance may be not renewable, but that firm power side. So any comments on that Big Island perspective? Yeah, I, the transition on the Big Island and, and all of our islands, uh, it needs to be done responsibly and uh, you know from a deliberate uh, planning standpoint uh, effectively. Um, so we need to make sure we have adequate resources that are coming online when others are retired, but we also do have concerns about maintenance. Uh, now there's, there's, there's different issues with that. Some of them really are specific to certain power producers that have 
unique issues that, that have uh, become extremely challenging recently on the Big Island. Um, others, though, are maybe systemic, and we're, we're looking at all, we get outage reports. Every time there's an outage, even if it's a small one, those come into the PUC. We look at those, we compile them, we, we consider uh, whether there are patterns uh, that might be visible in those outage reports, what the specific causes are of each outage and whether you've got unusual number of outages for certain causes that you know, are different than what we've seen historically and whether we need to take action uh, based on what we see in those reports. So we are, we are concerned about that uh, throughout all of the territories uh, in Hawaii uh, and you know, we're taking that seriously. Okay, yeah, I am, um, you know, again, initial conversation, proactive, not reactive, because we're facing a lot right now and this is the time to look at it all. So you guys are gonna be busy, um, but I think this is time we really need to do that for the community. Thank you, Chair. Members, any other questions? One. Senator McKelvey? I know, but you know, energy seems to dominate. Hey, speaking of which, <laughs> energy seems to dominate the conversation, but PC <clears throat> is more than that, right? And especially in the area of shipping, inner island shipping, transportation regulation. We have ADC and DBED looking at trying to basically create huge economic pillars on ag, ag diversification, shipping it to new markets. But obviously, to do that, you have to have what challenges in that area what work do you see in that area the PUC doing to address those concerns and try to realize this economic potential that both ADC and DBED have talked about? Uh, well we only have jurisdiction over inter-island yes. shipping um, but, but get to we, we did just uh, uh, talk to Young Brothers uh, the other day they, they came in and gave a briefing to us on their five-year strategic plan and their how they are doing you know getting through it, what their plans were for replacing some of their barges with new ones. Um, and agriculture did come up as an issue. It's something, they have the, this milk, milk run um, uh, concept that they've been recently using, but it's only for automobiles right now. But they've told us they want to extend it to include agriculture, and they've, they've been talking to agricultural producers on all the islands. They also mentioned uh, cattle um, as another specific industry that they'd have to take special accommodations to, to really make it work. Um, but they are committed to figuring that out and expanding what they currently offer in those areas. And they, they recognize there's a need, right? Like we don't have adequate shipment of agriculture between our islands. Um, we all have a collective interest in increasing the amount of local food production because of, I don't know, what is it, 85%, uh, 90% imported or something like that, right? So um, they, they seem to get it and care. We'll be watching carefully. We will be encouraging that type of expansion because we know that it's clearly needed in communities on all islands. Thank you, Chair. Uh, members, questions? Senator Lee? Uh, thank you. Um, I apologize. I just came from voting another committee, so I missed all of the discussion that happened prior. So if I ask <laughs> something that's duplicative, I apologize to everybody. Um, but thank you for the, for, for the opportunity. I think um, in 2014 or 15-ish, um, the PUC released uh, uh, sort of a white paper, commonly known as the Inclinations paper, which sort of charted out uh, kind of all the major issues that um, were present at the time in the utility um, rate payer compact and, and model, I guess, as, as we knew it at the time. Um, a lot of those were focused on trying to resolve the tension between utility shareholder interests and interests of rate payers. And there was some action taken since then to try and, or by, the, by not only the legislature, but also the PUC to try and better align those interests. Um, do you now, I guess, having been on the commission for a, a number of months now, um, have any thoughts as to whether all those issues, underlying issues that the inclinations highlighted have since been addressed? And where are we now? Yeah, the inclinations are uh, still kind of a foundational uh, guiding document for the PUC. We, we, we look at them still. Um, some of their, uh, their, some of the discussion, the inclination, <coughs> some of the ideas are, are outdated at this point, but many of them are not. Uh, it, it, you know, it focused on 
leveraging new technology. It focused on uh, accelerating the transition to renewable energy, um, but doing so in a reliable manner. I think, I think a lot of the, the, the big issues discussed in there are still unresolved, frankly, um, in, in the HECO territories anyway. KIUC has, you know, amazingly been uh, faster and, and more effective at getting to a, a point where they are not only, you know, 60 plus percent renewable, but they've also drastically reduced the effects of uh, price volatility from the oil market. And that's why their, their rates are lower than um, the rest of the islands. And that, that success is, is um, you know, it's important to, to understand it and look at it. It also is a very different grid and a different island community than the rest of, of the islands, but we can still learn from that. And I think, you know, there's, there's a lot of work left to do. Um, there, there is a point where updating the inclinations might be appropriate. And uh, especially, you know, what we've seen after the tragedy of Lahaina is that our infrastructure has more vulnerabilities than I think any of us realized. And we've got to confront those realities. We've got to figure out how to, how to improve it, how to make sure that Lahaina never happens again. And, um, and also how we continue the path towards renewable energy as quickly as possible and remaining a model. Like the, the last time I came before, this committee uh, to talk about, you know, becoming a part of the PUC. You know, I, I really focused on how are we going to do this effectively? How are we going to continue to inspire others beyond our small island state to accelerate their own transitions away from fossil fuel production? Because we are uniquely vulnerable as a, as a state to the effects of climate change in many, many ways. And to the, to the extent that we continue to be innovative, proactive um, and inspire other jurisdictions around the world to do similar things like that that would be a success that would be a success story for us so I I hope that we can continue on that path you know, part of that um, part of those findings at the time were that the existing paradigm as it was then um, was somewhat inefficient in effectuating sort of the broader intent of uh, policy goals and other things um, which ultimately resulted in probably higher costs than needed to be the case to ratepayers. Uh, you said a lot of that is still yet to be resolved. What would those forward steps look like, or could they look like? Well, we've got uh, performance-based rate making since the time of that, that those inclinations, right, PBR. Um, that is not fully implemented, right? We just, we just went through our first attempt at making it work and coming up with uh, performance incentive metrics or PIMs to incentivize the utility to do things faster and more effectively. Um, we're evaluating that now. We're trying to understand how we can make PBR more effective as a regulatory tool and more responsive. I think I didn't answer one other question earlier about RFPs and how are we getting enough power in. The uh, integrated grid plan that I, uh, you know, just recently was approved by the commission or accepted, I should say, by the commission. And that contemplates an RFP process of this continual. It'll have like every 18 months, we're gonna have a new RFP cycle so that uh, developers of energy projects can have some, you know, some consistency and some certainty about what's coming and when, and we'd like to continue to, appro to improve the RFP process itself, which in the past has been overly burdensome. Uh, we think it got a little better with RFP3, but can get even better, and the development cycle uh, in the past of five years to bring a new project online, this utility scale is way too long. Um, we'd like to try to reduce that to three years uh, or even better if we can somehow overcome some of the inherent regulatory hurdles that exist uh, in our state. Um, but uh, yes, I mean, we, we need to keep moving forward. We hope that the RFP um, cycle and IGP will help. We hope that improving PBR will help. And there's a bunch of other tools we have at our disposal as well that that we can make use of. Thank you, and Chair, if I could just one more. Uh, you know, following up on uh, what I think was some of the discussion from the last time you were here, uh, there's going to be projects down the road that are inevitably um, not lowest cost, but are there already on the grid. For example, H Power, which is such a huge chunk of um, the base load on Oahu for the moment, but which I think 2030 or 2032 the um, PPA is up, uh, or at least the contract with the city is up. Uh, if those are not 
um, even remotely the lowest cost sources of energy uh, at the time when the time comes. As you're looking forward, how do you assess uh, protection for ratepayers in that kind of case versus you have a bunch of legacy infrastructure that's probably um, stranded asset at that point? How, how do you deal with that? Whenever we are, whenever an application for a project comes before us, whether it's to uh, renew an old legacy project and extend it or to start from scratch, and we have to, to consider a number of factors. Um, greenhouse gas emissions is a prominent factor in that consideration, uh, as the Hawaii Supreme Court has kind of made clear over and over again. Uh, but there are other factors as well relating to uh, the reliability of the grid, um, to affordability, to uh, a, n a number of other things that we've got to balance. And so that, that's the process we go through. We have to do that balancing act. We have to make sure the grid continues to function and that the lights stay on. Um, there may be instances where, you know, like, like uh, you know, HECO is seeking to extend with Department of Health for a short amount of time to continue a legacy plant going so they can get another resource online if that's necessary. Those types of realities, pragmatic realities, are ones we will have to consider. We can't lose sight, though, of the overall goal of continuing to, to want to improve uh, affordability, to want to accelerate the transition to renewable energy. I mean, th those are still our guiding stars. But while we do that, we can't fall off a cliff, right? So we want to be responsible, but we also want to remember our guiding stars. Sure, I appreciate that. Let me put this in a little more uh, context. You know, there have been a number of attempts over the years as projects have become increasingly more, say, challenging in some communities, um, regardless of their technology or whatever. You just tend to have a lot more scrutiny of the projects, uh, and rightly so, and um, potential opposition. So there have been a number of attempts to look at how do you um, learn from other places that are facing similar challenges but have successfully been able to create a path for a lot of those projects that eliminates a lot of the risk for investors, that also creates um, a more certain timeline for implementation and, and all the things. Um, the PUC here has somewhat resisted any attempts to move away from the um, universal cost model. There's actually a better term for it that's escaping me at the moment. But essentially, everybody pays and benefits exactly the same, mm -hmm. um, which doesn't account in many cases for host communities where I think you're seeing a lot of the tension and conflict arise. So in the future, as you have projects probably run into increasing levels of opposition, uh, again, agnostic to technology or whatever, but just in general, how do you feel about changing that paradigm such that host communities can be provided additional benefits, separate and apart from uh, you know, community benefits packages and whatever that are subject to developer approval, but rather, for example, if you're creating X number of dollars in rate savings collectively, can a host community then be given just a little bit more of a benefit there, a little bit higher savings because they're the ones that are hosting projects and provide a tangible nexus between a project that may be developed and the community in which it sits? Uh, short answer is yes. Uh, we are open to that. Uh, that is a, a topic of discussion in the equity docket that we opened and we're looking beyond community benefit packages to other um, other types of uh, benefits to the community that that where there's a nexus between the project that's being built and the benefit to the community beyond just you know potential lowering of rates there, there might also be something to consider would be the resiliency of that community right you could you could include potentially uh, in a project's design, a microgrid that serves critical loads and other disaster related needs so that the community could uh, more successfully survive if they were happen to be totally cut off. We've got uh, something like 60% of our communities are sort of one road in, one road out, and are extremely vulnerable to, um, to getting trapped for a, a period of time without infrastructure support. So building up resiliency of those communities and maybe doing it in conjunction with new projects that come online um, that ideally are more community driven from the outset, which is a real challenge in all kinds of different ways. But that, that's another uh, goal is trying to figure out how to make these things more community driven rather than Im imposed on communities and learn from a number of lessons of the past. Um, Eco's trying to do something, you know, 
that's related to this with the renewable energy zone concept that's in the the inner, the, um, the IGP. And that is not fully formed as a concept, but is one that we support, you know, continuing to look at and improving. The idea there is that those zones are kind of get community feedback and blessing ahead of time, and then developers know where where they can go and have less, you know, less opposition, an easier path to getting a, an interconnection faster. So, if that pro, if that concept concedes that succeeds, that would be the kind of thing it would achieve. And then, Chair, the very last thing uh, may be permissible. Uh, you know, in a, most other utility uh, service areas, you have some form of contract situation where um, third party entities can generate and sell power across the grid, paying some sort of um, requisite fee to the utility for the use of their poles and wires, essentially wheeling here as we've come to know it. Uh, how do you feel about that? Because that's been something that has been not permitted here. Um, uh, and there have been a number of state projects, much less other projects, that could have benefited from something like that with the University of Hawaii and others saving taxpayers a bunch of money. Um, where, do, where do you see that going, that, that, that mechanism kind of going? And ultimately, where do you see the utility going? Um, are they more a, uh, you know, poles and wires distribution company opening up the grid? Or is it, where does that go? Well, our, our chair, uh, Asuncion, just recently committed to the legislature and, and Commissioner Akwaye and I support him uh, that we, regardless of what happens this legislative session, we are going to open a, a docket on Wheeling uh, generally to investigate uh, and, and get to a conclusion, you know, by 2026, just bring it to conclusion as to what the state policy should be regarding whether we can open it up and, and allow more of that on the grid. Uh, we're, we're interested in that. Um, before the disaster in Lahaina, one of my personal priorities was to try to start a new docket on intergovernmental wheeling because I felt like that, that was just a, an obvious thing, right? Like government entities and, and other uh, public entities that are, are, don't have any consumer protection type concerns relating to them should be allowed to produce power and and share the benefits of that renewable energy with other government um, users of the grid. And that was sidelined uh, because of, we needed to pivot and focus on the immediate needs of reliability and safety uh, for the public after the disaster on Maui. But, but it's still something that's very uh, prominent in my mind. It's something we've got to deal with and see if we can, we can uh, make some progress there. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Members, any other questions? Yeah, just a quick Senator comment. Chair. Um, thank you. This conversation brought up something on the Big Island. Uh, with our steps towards renewable energy, having that firm power is important. We ran into a situation where we had photovoltaic on the west side, but it was very cloudy for a couple of days. Unusual. But at the same time, we were dealing with a drought. And so the hydroelectric generation on the Hilo side was down. Very unusual. But at the same time, the wind stopped blowing. And so it put us in a unique situation that ordinarily, because we had different facets in the portfolio, we shouldn't have had a problem, but we did. And going forward, as we're talking about the resiliency on you know, microgrids or however you want to term um, that, Tying those different energy projects together is what we're trying to do, but still we hit a problem. And so um, going forward, as we're making these decisions, you know, I find an interesting conversation about wheeling, um, but I think we also have to think back on what is going to actually be firm. Uh, because again, Big Island, almost a perfect storm. Who would have thought that we'd be dry, cloudy, and no wind? for three or four days it did create a problem so i just leave that as part of the conversation thank you chair uh members any other questions okay uh hopefully not but most likely i think for me as chair of this committee i will look back on this session as as one of the years that the the bill for climate change started to come due for the state of Hawaii, especially given the, the subject matter that we've had to address on this committee this year, not just HECO, but also insurance and several other items. 
the last time you were before this committee on the resolution that the Senate uh, uh, just uh, passed out regarding the investigation of the Maui wildfire, there was a discussion about capacity in the PUC. And this conversation brought me back to that because essentially what I heard you say was that the resources necessary to allow the PUC to take the lead or to take a more active role in uh, the investigations that are going on were beyond the scope of the PUC's capability. And it just seems to me like that that's just one small piece of what everything that's going on uh, under your purview. Uh, so how do you see that? And I guess maybe a more searching question would be in response to, I think, Senator Wakai's question in that hearing, why haven't you guys come to us sooner and asked for a lot more resource? Because it seems like there are some real substantive justifications for that. Yeah, on that last point, I, I got corrected by my colleagues after that hearing. Uh, I guess we did um, seek to more additional funds related to wildfire uh, issues uh, it, from the uh, it's to be part of the governor's budget, but that I think it was somehow combined with the attorney general's request in the ultimate budget that was submitted to the legislature. And I'm not I'm not the the expert on exactly how it all went down, but uh, that we did it initially right after the the disaster seek to try to build up some resources. Uh, traditionally, we haven't been uh, general funded at all. Obviously, we're just funded through our, uh, the, the, the rate, rate fees and, and so forth that get on utility bills. But I, I think the state of Hawaii, generally, whether it's the PUC or, or some other agency, absolutely needs additional resources and competency to do, on a statewide basis, those types of forensic uh, investigations and analysis. Uh, and even you know, to review wildfire mitigation plans, we're going to have to come up with additional resources right, to do that effectively um, well, so again we're we're sort of running short on time and yeah uh the ways and means chair is here and i would like to yield to members who are coming in to ask questions so get ready for that one okay but the 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 I, i'm cutting you off because that's sort of what i was trying to preface the wildfire investigation is just one sliver of what's going on you've had multiple questions here about wheeling about whether hiko should move to a poles and wires model about renewable energy, uh, energy generation, about firm generation, and about how we're gonna deal with the increasing instability that climate change is causing when it comes to our main maintenance of the grid and service for the public. So I, 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 you know, I'm alarmed that now we have the PUC coming in and admitting, yeah, we need more money for the fire investigation. It sounds like you need more support for all of this stuff because the, we, we have capacity, as you alluded to, and I acknowledge we have capacity in the ATF, in the county, and in the attorney general's office that's already on that. So, so somebody is already on that. They may not be in the way we want, but no one else is on these other questions except for you. And it's pretty clear that there are just a lot of unanswered items there that you're kind of acknowledging and admitting here that you guys cannot handle. So why aren't you asking and why haven't you asked sooner? I, I don't know that I'd say we can't handle uh, a lot of these issues. I think we are working hard to handle them as, you know, as best we can. Should, should we have more resources? I don't... Um, I think in the, in the long term, yes. I've, I've been here the, the least amount of time, so I feel uncomfortable speaking on behalf of the commission in terms of exactly what the resource needs are. I don't, I'm not the one on the commission that deals with the budget um, or um, requests to the legislature for additional funding. That hasn't been my role in the last 17 months. Um, but I can see, you know, through our discussions and through everything we know in the public that I, I think we are, we have a lot of work ahead of us and as you said you know is this the first 
notice of the bill coming due for climate change um, in, a, in a major way, yes, but I'm sure we will have additional challenges ahead and we're need, we need to prepare for them uh, better than we have in the past. So that will take resources, it will take, but we, you know, it's a balancing act for all of us, for the legislature as well. You've got multiple priorities. You've got to figure out what to do first and uh, we appreciate that. Um, we do appreciate the support of the legislature, and we will do the best we can with the resources we have. But one of the last thing we are, you know, regardless again of what happens in this session, we are moving forward with the HERA concept ourselves. Uh, we will do a surcharge on uh, the large project utility interconnections uh, that will help fund uh, HERA and uh, start updating the reliability standards that are already in place to start addressing some of these issues we care about, but that will also bring some more funds into the PUC and will allow us to, to turn some of our compliance officer folks into people who go out and do more work reviewing the quality and the, the safety of the infrastructure. That, that's one of the goals we have is to be more involved in directly inspecting and reviewing uh, what's happening in the field, in, in the real world. Thank you, Senator De La Cruz. Thank you. You may have covered it already, but it, it appears to me that the PUC is mainly reactive and not so much proactive. And just hearing your thoughts about, you know, you're not really involved in the legislative component or the budget component. It would seem that the three of you would want to figure out at least annually, what do you want to accomplish? And what's involved in accomplishing that? So you may not have to be in the details, but you, you at least know how it's all connected because the three of you should be talking about that. Um, how do you intend to help change the culture so you can be a lot more proactive? We've had a lot of these issues that we keep almost recycling. And I find that the legislature tends to be a lot more aggressive in urging the PUC to catch up with a lot of these issues, including things like firm renewable. And if, if we're constantly urging you and pulling the PUC along, then is that how this relationship is going to be in the future, that we're just urging you to do your job? I hope not. Uh, I, I, I agree with you that we have a lot of opportunity and authority to be proactive. Uh, when I first came to the commission, the, the marching orders are kind of the priorities that I understood was to try to improve the slow pace of a lot of the decision making at the PUC, that there have been issues with just the PUC having docket churn, you know, things get get caught up in that procedure and they never get to decision, right? So one of the, the things that uh, my fellow commissioners and I have done our best to do and I think had some success in the last 17 months is moving things forward and not just, even though electricity remains the, the, the lion's share of our work, looking at all of the utilities that are before us and trying to keep everything moving in a timely manner. And I think we have been making a lot of progress in that area. I think but we that, have. That's just all playing catch up. Yeah, that's but playing I, catch up. But I, that, I'm talking so, about how do we <laughs> take it so that you guys can be a lot more proactive because we have this 2045 goal. Yeah. And we have a lot of bills now delaying int, interim goals later to 2045, trying to expand it, but still moving them all back later. So we're not holding anybody accountable to even meet the interim goals. And in many cases, there are no benchmarks for interim goals. They just have the end goal, hope, and everyone thinks that, oh, in one year, we're going to be able to do it between 2044 and 2025, 45. How, how, why isn't the PUC look, working backwards saying, if this is the goal by 2045, what are the things that have to be in place from a regulatory point of view so we can meet, meet these benchmarks? I, I don't find any discussion going on. So I think that is the discussion we're having right now. I mean, when I got here, it was sort of, catch up, like you say, and now I think we are somewhat caught up and are ready to be more proactive. Uh, the IGP RFP process that is about to start is an example of that because it had these 18 month cycles for new projects to come in uh, much, much faster than the prior RFP. So what kind of discussions then if, as you develop these interim goals, hopefully, what kind of discussions are you having with at least the, com the committee chairs? Because some of this should include what are the tax relief measures for other renewables other than solar, since solar is heavily subsidized by us? What, are we, what else are we going to do to diversify our portfolio on our side? Because you can't provide tax relief. You can't purchase property. You can't do a lot of the things that we can do and that we should be doing. But we're getting very little direction from Office of Energy or the PUC 
on how we can even be more proactive. I don't, I don't find that occurring. Um, I, I, I thank you for your, your feedback on that. I, I haven't been involved in the, that level of policy discussion from you know, legislative leadership and so forth. Uh, that's, that's other uh, chair, uh, chair Ascension in our uh, commission is the person on point on those matters. So I'm not fully familiar with all the discussions that may have taken place. So I'm, I'm not sure I can answer your question directly, well, we but give, I hear instance, you. We give, we give tax credits to solar. Right. But when now we're, when we're looking at firm renewables or any other type of renewable energy, how do we make sure that there's equity? Because if not, we're picking winners and losers by, by only giving certain technologies tax credits. I think, it's, I think it's completely fair to assess and reassess uh, the incentives that the state provides to make sure that we are getting forward to a balanced portfolio of resources. Um, and that, that is directly in our statute that we've got to consider a, n a number of factors, right? Not just, not just greenhouse gases, not just one type of technology over another. That's not what we're supposed to do. Um, so, I mean, I support that conceptually. I haven't been involved in specific conversations with, with uh, legislative leadership uh, regarding, it hasn't been my role yet, but, but I, I support what you're saying conceptually. Well, as, you, as, you, as the three of you meet to discuss that, hopefully you can take all of these thoughts and come up with something that you can really present to us, even informally throughout the interim, so that we can have a lot more meaningful discussion, so we can prepare for next session as to what kind of tax credits, what kind of land acquisition, what kind of, I mean, I really believe Office of Energy should be looking at land acquisition as well, so that they can do their own RFPs for renewable. You know, but I, it's hard, it's, I feel, I feel we're, we're a lot more proactive than a lot of the agencies are, which is kind of awkward, but, I'm hoping you guys can change that. I will absolutely uh, have conversations with my fellow commissioners on those issues. Thank you. I commit to that. Members, any other questions? Just, Senator just Lee. One. Um, you know, assuming that the legislature does something uh, on the HECO front uh, in response to the Maui fires and some of the risk and other things that are out there, not only what that's going to look like yet, uh, is there a role you see for the PUC in following up? So, for example, if we lay out, here's the mechanisms and financing tools and whatever you guys have uh, a year or two from now once we kind of get some direction on where the utilities headed and and what the financial markets are doing do you see a role for the puc and stepping in at that point and sort of reviewing and saying okay this is working or it's not are you guys going to have for example your own follow-up package um, so that we're not the ones to the chair's point the legislature having to kind of drive the bus here figure out you know, when the utility comes in and says do this or other stakeholders or IPPs come in and say do that, it's not just us reacting because you guys have way more expertise and way more um, you know, on the ground knowledge than, than we do. I think that's a reasonable good suggestion. Um, certainly like with a wildfire mitigation plan, that's gonna be something that we would be reviewing and would have to comment on and give feedback to the legislature as to how it's going, whether we think it's effective or not. Um, I hope that like a mitigation fund won't be needed. If it's established, we hope, hope it doesn't need to get tapped into again anytime soon, uh, but that would be another type of thing. Uh, securitization will come before the PUC. We'll have to look at that very carefully if that passes the legislature. Uh, and under the current terms of the, the bills I'm familiar with, you know, we, we have a very prominent role there and, and being the, the last gatekeeper to make sure that it's being done in the public interest and responsibly. So I think we would absolutely have an interest in giving feedback to the legislature as to how it went, uh, whether or not changes need to be made in the concept or the, the, the mechanism. And we need to have those kind of conversations. So yes. Yeah, I raise that because, you know, I mean, we're obviously not the only place going through this right now, but there have been other utilities and other service areas that have been through bankruptcy and have had access to whatever their respective states mechanisms are they're putting forward, which is great. Um, but in one case, for example, right now I'm thinking of there's a utility um, in the Southwest who's went through this whole process that access to securitization and other mechanisms um, with the same intent of providing a financial stable path forward. And fast forward a couple of years now, rates are up in that service territory over $30 per month. Uh, meanwhile, the utilities had their most profitable couple years in its history. And so there's a lot of moving parts 
that can lead to perhaps unintended consequences. And the folks who are going to know first before us, other than the angry emails we'll get from the public for sure, um, would be the PUC. And so I think having some sort of um, expectation that you're going to step in to be able to evaluate this stuff and come back to us with recommendations uh, would be really, really important. Okay, I, I hear you. I, I thank you for that. Um, if there was a Senate resolution specifically, you know, giving us a deadline to give you a report, that would be one easy mechanism. I'm I'm a little bit of a novice in terms of the interaction between the PUC as an agency and the legislature on sort of an ongoing informal basis. So I don't know all of the normal ways we do it, but I'm supportive of that type of dialogue continuing continuously, um, and we'll do my best to try to facilitate that. So, um, I regret to inform you that we need to uh, end this hearing at 11.15. We have other members who have come forward and requested the opportunity to ask you questions. And I have at least five more questions to ask you. So I'm going to be inclined at this point to recommend that we defer decision making on your nomination to next week, Thursday, April 11th at 9.30 a.m. in this room uh, so that all the members who have questions can ask you questions. Uh, my inclination is that it's not a reflection on you. It's just the fact that this has stimulated a lot of very important and substantive discussion among the members. And uh, we got a bunch of late GMs, and I wanted to try and get you guys all taken care of. Right on one day and we failed. So uh, on that note, I will um, acknowledge Senator Dela Cruz for his question. I just had one more question. You know, it seems to be the trend, unfortunately, that we're having a lot more rolling blackouts. Mm. I mean, the big island. And if it wasn't for the power plant in Schofield, Oahu would have really been hit bad. And so we had to rely on the military to make sure that we had continuous power. What is the PUC going to do to make sure that that's not an issue? And why are we depending on, the, on, on military bases to support the grid? I find that that's kind of an awkward situation to be in. And is our portfolio of energy not that reliable that we have to now depend on military bases for continuous power throughout Oahu? If we had a lot more firm renewable, that wouldn't be the case. So how, how, is, how is the PUC going to address this? So we agree uh, that there are greater uh, concerns about adequate utility resources, generation resources, than, than even the utility thought. Uh, the rolling blackout situation we had on Oahu surprised the utility, it seemed to us. I don't think it surprised us. We've been talking about firm renewable for several years. That's, that's true, but the, the confluence of, on that specific day, they were surprised that it happened to that extent because they have a, a margin of around 30% that they seek to maintain to, as a reserve, um, but they uh, needed about 200 additional megawatts on that specific day because of you know, no solar, no wind, because of of issues in the weather, um, and then also some issues with maintenance and, and other plants going down all at the same time. And they were really left very short on Oahu, right? 200 megawatts is, is a substantial part of our generation mix. So I think that's true on, on, obviously on Hawaii Island, it's true on Maui, and it's true on Oahu, that all three of those islands need uh, more attention to uh, development of new resources to bring online to make sure that we don't have those types of situations. And some firm resources are absolutely necessary as part of that. They are proposed as part of RFP3. There are a number of firm resources on all of these islands that are proposed. Um, and we will do our best to, to try to move those things through the process quickly. Every single project that's proposed obviously has a, a kind of a lengthy cycle to actually get it up and running. But we want to try to make that faster uh, that, that's been a, a very um, high priority of ours. So is the RFP a piecemeal approach, or where is the holistic plan that shows that the RFP is a component of the holistic plan? Because I go back to 
some of these other technologies we may, which may need some assistance, but won't need long-term assistance, like unfortunately solar has had long-term assistance, we can provide that assistance to make sure there's a diverse portfolio. But we're not finding, going back to that, any kind of dialogue between the PUC and the legislature that tries to ensure that both sides are doing what they can to have a diverse portfolio. Right. The PUC is not traditionally, in my understanding, a planning agency. It's, it's more of a, uh, a regulatory uh, agency that approves No, that's fine. Things, but then why aren't but... you asking the Office of Energy, where is the plan? So if you're not yeah. going to do the plan Office of Energy, then maybe we have to. And then you ask us for the resources for planning. But why, why are we continuing to do one docket at a time without any kind of made kind of plan? Right. Something holistic, something comprehensive. HECO's integrated grid plan, which was recently completed and we accepted our yeah. earlier this year, is a starting point. It does contain uh, a lot of information that's useful, but, that, but, that's but it's not utility. everything you're talking about. Yeah, we, need, like we need the fox guarding the hen house. Yeah. So you're going to have the utility come up with the plan. Right. Is that, I don't, I don't know if everyone feels that that's the best approach. We, we did not approve that plan. We just accepted that I'm it just saying, been filed, going back right. to, it should be Office of Energy, PUC, the legislature, not the tail wagging the dog. That's a fair point. Just follow up on that real quick. Okay. There, there were two, last question. Yeah, we yeah. Gotta... There, there were two other things um, that I think uh, the chair had brought up with respect to the rolling blackouts and all of that. Um, and two of those things are fixable, I think, beyond just you know putting in new generation. One was that um, the number of projects that should have been online at that point were not um, as a result of a whole number of things in the process. So I guess the question is, what can the PUC do there to make sure that there's um, backup plans? Yeah, yeah, not only backup plans, but also clear timelines because yeah. everybody's relying on that. Yeah. And then secondly, the large battery storage um, that could have been used that day was simply just not charged from any source. Could have been charged from Kahe or any power plant regardless of power. So how do we, is there something we can do to both those points? HECO has learned some lessons regarding how to utilize that new battery storage facility. It was at 80% charge, is my understanding, the morning of the rolling blackouts. But it, if it was 100%, that would have been better. It's not a panacea, though. It's not big enough to, to have resolved the problems that day. They needed 200 additional megawatts, and that doesn't, doesn't output that much. Um, so uh, yes, there's more that we can do on those, on those scores specifically. and. HECO is getting better in its RFP process of overestimating what it needs. Like, for example, on the RFP3 for Hawaii Island, I believe they are seeking 153% of their uh, needs, yeah. their projected needs. And so, because you know the projects always fall out, right? So they, they're going overboard to try to make sure that whatever does come online at least gets them to 100. And that, that is the type of thing we're, we're looking at encouraging and pushing for, right? To, Go overboard. We, like we need to go overboard at this point. We haven't anticipated all of the problems that occur with grid operation as well as we should have, and we're going to need to add some additional resources to give us redundancy, to give us resiliency backup. Um, we can't just rely on everything working perfectly all the time. And not that HECO has been doing that, but it, it's been obviously getting too close to the line, and we've been having problems. Wait, sorry, I don't want to interrupt. I'll say my mistake on the battery. Thank you. We, we, have, we have one more minute. So you, when you say HECO learned a lot, what about the PUC? Didn't, they didn't learn a lot? And why are we continuing to say, oh, well, it's HECO's responsibility, or HECO's learning? It should be the HECO, I guess HECO should be learning, but so, so should the PUC on how it ha needs to evolve so they can be better manage the situation. We are doing our best to learn as well. I mean, that, that's why... I'm here. I, ho I hope I hope I'm demonstrating some reasonable fluency with the issues that we're dealing with and, and the specific facts. Um, I try myself to, to be up to speed on those things and try to understand how to get to the right answer. Just but going yes, back to Senator Lee's point, point, though, once you understand those issues, what are the timelines, what are the deadlines, so that you, those issues can be resolved in a timely manner, being a lot more proactive instead of just acknowledging that these are issues and then nothing happens. Right. Um, well, the IGP RFP process where it has 18 months development cycles, like much faster development cycles to get new projects in and also to kind of accommodate for 
projects falling out, they can come back in to the queue as quick, more, you know, a lot faster rather than waiting several years for a new RFP. That's an example of the kind of thing we've been pushing, and we'll continue yeah. to find other similar just, solutions. Just not as holistic, though. So that's where. Yeah, we're, we're trying to be holistic, but we're not. Yeah, we, I, I agree. There's improvement. There's improvement to be done for sure. And, and on that note, I'm going to step in. I'm going to recess this hearing, and we're going to reconvene. Next week, Thursday, April 11th at 9.30 a.m. in this room 229 for additional questions. And what I'll do to be fair to the members and also to you, Mr. Yost, is we'll be sending out a memorandum to the, to the members of the Senate asking that if there are additional questions that we'd like you to answer, that they submit them to uh, my office so that we can distribute them to you by close of business on Monday. And uh, if you would so choose, it's up to you, would like to respond to some of those or any of the other questions brought up in this hearing today in writing that you uh, please do so the day before the hearing. That sounds fine. Thank okay, you. Okay, great. Thank you very much. We're adjourned.